welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of my story to the world. And this time, I have a very interesting person with me. I'm so honored to have you today, sir. Uh, would you would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. First of all, you don't have to call me sir. Uh, <laughs> you, you can just call me by my first name or yes. or whatever, Schaefer. Um, I'm Schaefer Parker. And uh, for a number of years here in the city of Calvary, where I still live, I was the pastor of Hawkwood Baptist Church. And I've pastored churches in other parts of Canada and also in the United States where I was born. Um, I know I know, I don't look it. I look extremely young, but I am <laughs> yes, actually in do. my 70s now. And, uh, How and, old are you and, again? I'm sorry? How old are you? Well, I'm 71 to be precise. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I'm in my 70s now. And uh, and semi-retired in the sense that, well, officially, as far as the government is concerned, but <laughs> by the grace of God, I continue to be preaching almost every Sunday uh, and um, and very active in other forms of ministry to the point that, you know, my wife and I hardly see each other any more now than we did when I was a full-time pastor. Uh, and so... Um, just maybe one or two other things. I was born in Texas, uh, in in a little town north of Houston, Texas, if that locates it for you at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then uh, when I was ten, we moved to the state of Nevada and lived about eighty miles outside of Reno, uh, Nevada. And my dad worked in a in a copper mine, and uh, and we uh, m- my parents were involved in church planting in that state way back in the nineteen sixties. And uh, when I was uh, yeah, so way back in the 1960s, and and then um, I uh, I don't know what else to say. I I have uh, three. I have a brother and and uh, and two sisters, and so there were six of us. And then I got married in 1976, and my wife and I have two children, two grown sons. They're in their 40s now, and we have seven grandchildren and one uh, great grandchild on the way. So because our oldest, one of our oldest grandsons is married uh, and has or has a wife now, and and. Uh, is um and they're expecting their first so wow yeah. yeah you are so how will i say so blessed i am you, see, that, you are seeing like the fourth generation now that's amazing well now wait no i'm if i'm the first generation then we have yes. our son and then we have our grandson you're right fourth generation that's exactly yes. right I, <laughs> i'm not i've never been really good with numbers but <laughs> anyway wow so when are we, is it is the baby due in 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 this in summer? In September, if, if September. I understand it correctly. So yeah, oh, and she's beautiful. she is big with child, shall we say? Oh, and, that's uh, great. Yeah. I'm 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 so that's exciting. Your grandchildren are now about to have children. That's something good. That's something good to live to see. Did you? It does is. that mean you married early? Not terribly. I was twenty three and my wife was twenty four when we got married. So we were not extremely young. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we were not, uh, but by the grace of God, we were, um, able to, to, um, you know, we, we still both feel quite young. I, I'm not, this is going to sound like bragging, but three weeks ago, I just got back from an eight day motorcycle trip, uh, that I, me and five other guys or four other guys were five of us all together. Um, and we went over to Vancouver Island and we deliberately searched for the, uh, the the worst the narrowest twistiest paved roads you know that that would challenge you as you drove around the island and looked at everything uh i put on uh 2000 miles in 8 days and uh, so just a little over 2000 miles actually so that involved 8 to 10 hours of driving a day and and so forth and 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 the young the two youngest were in their 20s and i was the oldest you know 71 and then there were a couple in the middle there so <laughs> but but wow. I was able to I was able to do it and all I can say is to God be the glory and it was a great wow. time. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. Okay, so so my story to the world. We want to hear some stories from your life that are interesting that you feel that people listening can learn from that have a lesson and you feel more people should hear about this because they would learn it a thing or two. So do you have any such stories from any part of your life, maybe? Well, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that to me yesterday, of course, yeah. when we first talked about this. And I, w- I was thinking about um, about what that could mean and, and actually asking the Lord to guide my heart. And one of the things that has been, because of some other work I'm involved with, 
I've been really reminded lately of how important, important it is that we learn to serve others and to, to give our lives to other people. Uh, that the person who, who says, I'm here for God to bless me, rarely feels blessed. But the person who says, if I'm here to bless others, God, how can I become a blessing to others in pouring our lives out to other people? Uh, then we find that there's joy in our life, purpose in our life, and all those things. And so because I've been really reminded of that a lot lately, I, I've, I've prayed and asked the Lord to help me. To, and one of the things that, that uh, stood out for me in my memory, and this goes all the way back to childhood, is that I was fortunate to be born to two, two, two parents, a mother and a father both, who loved to give their lives to other people, uh, to give away their lives in service and so forth. Um, now, I'll tell you, for example, my own mother um, always had, and, and I noticed this right up until, until her sudden and unexpected death. She was in good health as far as anybody knew, and she had a cerebral hemorrhage in 1984 when she was only 59 years old. And like I say, living strong and living healthy and, and very active life. And, um, and then all of a sudden one day she was gone because a blood vessel in her brain burst open and, and, uh, and she bled to death in, you know, an interior bleeding in her, in her, in her brain. Um, she bled to death. And, and so she went to be with the Lord. But the reason I bring it up is to say, uh, bring, bring up her life is to say that I never knew a more, well, the only person who equaled her in, in terms of just a life of joy and a life of, of, of peace and purpose, I never knew anyone who equaled her other than maybe my own father. Both of them just exuded that character quality of joy and peace and purpose, uh, and, and they did it through serving others. And I'll explain some of that. Um, as when my brother and I, we're only uh, 16 months apart. And so when my brother and I uh, would go off to school um, every every morning, we'd have to go to school after we were both, you know, seven, eight, nine, well, six, seven, eight. And, um, and, and my, wherever my mother lived, literally from when we were children, right up until the day she died, there seemed to be this spontaneous collection of young wives and mothers, so young women who were just getting started in their adult life, would just naturally gravitate to her. And so it was amazing. They'd get up in the morning, they'd get their kids off to school, their older kids, if they had some, or, or, or they'd bring, and this was the part that irritated my brother and I, they would bring their little, you know, in those days, we tended to think of them as their little brats, their little <laughs> two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old brats over to the house. And, and the funny thing about my mom was, she didn't really, like, she didn't have a program for these young women. She would go on do what she was doing. She loved to sew, and in fact, we were not in any way well off when we were children. There were four of us kids, and my, my dad worked in a, a foundry when I was a, a little kid, later in a, in a copper mine. So he always had a labor kind of job. And, um, and my mother taught piano, but, you know, you're not going to get rich teaching piano part-time. And, and, <laughs> um, and so... Um, we never had a lot of money, and one of the ways my mother saved money was she sewed a lot of the clothes that all of us wore, even us guys, our pants, our shirts, my sister's dresses, uh, and in those days, she and her own dresses, and in those days, women uh, largely only wore dresses, and, and, uh, and, and so she sewed all those things, and I still remember, you know, if I was home for whatever reason, maybe school was out on, a, on in the, you know, maybe the holiday or something, uh, that involved school, but not the rest of the workforce. And so my dad would be gone, but these women would still all come over and we'd, and, and my mom would be at her sewing machine, just sewing away. And there'd be four or five, maybe even six women sitting around the bed in the bedroom there and, uh, and all just chattering away about life with my mother interjecting of, you know, a word of scripture or a word of wisdom or, or perhaps just joining in whatever fun they were having and, and just, somehow serving as a, a, um, a sin, I don't know how to describe it, but just a, a center of this circle of women. And that was when we lived in Texas, it happened. When we moved to Nevada, it happened. When we, and when my parents moved to Canada uh, to help plant ch a, a church, well, they actually two churches in Canada. When they moved to, to uh, British Columbia, it happened there. And, uh, and, and I don't even know how many uh, 
women there are in our world today named Joy because that was my mother's name and so many of the women who had children, uh, female children, after they knew my mother would name their little daughter after, after my mother. So they'd name her Joy. And, uh, and so what did I learn there? I learned something about uh, about giving your life away to others, about about welcoming people into your lives. Um, as uh, 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 years ago now, but there was a, a, a pastor of a large church teaching about ministry, and I was listening, and he said, I always tell my people, uh, tell my staff, uh, associate pastors and so forth, people are not an interruption to your ministry. People are your ministry. And, uh, <laughs> and I and totally was, agree. Yes. That is so true. And if there was anybody who uh, believed that and, and lived that, it was both of my parents. Now, I've, I've talked about my mother, but let me tell you about my dad. Uh, again, it was never something that seemed planned, but he would get home from work in the late afternoon. And, um, uh, you know, he worked all day at the, at the foundry and, and he would get home. And then sure enough, uh, right alongside my father would come uh, other men that worked, maybe some worked where he worked and some worked uh, elsewhere, but they would stop by the house. And, and um, I learned to make coffee almost before I could walk. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he would have a pot of coffee on, or he would send me to make a pot of coffee. And these guys would all just sit around. And I can't tell you now, remember I was, I was born in 1953 so, and the Second World War was less than 10 years before that. A number of these men fought in the war, and they all lived through it. And so that was a huge, you know, thing in their life. I can't tell you how many times I heard um, stories about experiences they had in the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, I learned a whole lot about history and, and about, about terrible things in our world through listening to these guys chat and talk. But the thing is, my dad never let the subject the, the, the primary subject of the importance of a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. He never let that, that get too far away. And out of that circle of caught, and again, it happened wherever he lived. When we lived in Nevada, men would come by after work. You know, you always hear these stories about men who leave work and stop by the bar on the way home. And uh, before they get home, they're already half drunk. And then they're you know, then they behave badly when they come home or they fall asleep and they're, they're kind of not even part of the family life at night because they're already, you know, and already kicked off or, you know, and gone to sleep and, 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 or whatever. These men went home alive. They went home more in love with their wives than they had been. They went home ready to, to meet with their kids and, and interact with their children. They went home ready to, to stand up for Jesus. And they did so partly because of the quiet, joyful influence of my own father in, in, in their lives. And, uh, and I, I don't know how to, I, I don't know how, you know, you were asking me also to mention how this changed my own life. Yes. I've always worried that, um, okay, let me, like when I've been a pastor, I've been a pastor now since 1979. So that was quite a while. Actually, I was an associate pastor for four years before that, from 1975 on. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I've, I've served a lot of places and I always hear people say, you know, I never, I never feel that I've been that great a pastor, you know, because some pastors are able to organize a big congregation with thousands of people attending and, and, you know, maybe 20 or 30 staff members or all those. I never served that kind of church, but wherever I served, the churches maybe didn't grow large, but they always grew, thank the Lord. And People would say to me, you're one of the best pastors, or and I, it sounds like I'm bragging on myself, you're the best, <laughs> but somehow I learned from my parents how to be interested in the people and involved in their lives at a level that, you know, maybe I only saw them before church or after church or at, at some function at church, but to just sit down with them and let them speak to me or make myself available to them uh, in a way that um, I don't think I would have naturally done without the example of my parents. So... Uh, they were, they, and I mentioned that my parents helped the church uh, as church planters. They were never, now my dad at age 55, he went, or actually at age 53, he went back, he went to Bible school and then graduated at age 55 and did become a pastor for the last 10 years of his, you know, active life, so to speak. I mean, actually he served two churches, that one and then one other, but, but, uh, so up until he was about 70, he was an active pastor from wow. 55 to 70. And, um, 
himself. And uh, but but he was always, as I mentioned, a laborer. He was a welder in a foundry. Uh, he was a laborer in a copper mine. And my mother was just a, a church worker, you might say, a Sunday school teacher and just whatever needed do, doing. But so did my, and my father taught. But the point is that uh, they were there to help the pastor and to help the church. And so they served to plant, I don't even know, I think about five churches in Nevada and two churches in Brit British Columbia. Uh, and uh, and so they were always there to, uh, to, to, you know, as church planters, even though they, and they thought of themselves as that, although they were not pastors or pastor's wives or you know, that's not there. They were just ordinary people. And sometimes ordinary people can get more done because among other things, if they don't think of you as Pastor Parker, then they'll just open up and talk to you yes. about whatever's on their heart in a way they might not do if they think of you as the holy True. man. You know, so. <laughs> so that's one story. You asked me to think of something, and, I, and, I, and, I, and actually it's been good for me because it makes me want to be more like them in the sense that they, and, and think about it, they were like, they were more like Jesus because that when you read the Gospels, that's what you discover, that much of his work was done walking along with his disciples and just talking about things as they walk and uh, sometimes as they fished and sometimes as they ministered to a whole crowd of people in various ways, sometimes feeding them, you know, feeding the 5,000, sometimes uh, lining people up to be ministered to by Jesus as he healed the sick and so forth. And, and, uh, and so I think this is what we need to do is we need to be uh, more like Jesus in the sense that we are the kind that welcome people into our lives and in so doing we welcome them into the presence of jesus if he's in our lives of course um there's a there's a famous poem and i don't have it memorized and it's actually quite long but it's uh, by a, a pastor named shoemaker um he was a, he served a large church in washington dc way back he's dead now but uh the name of the poem is i stand by the door and he talks about the fact that some people want to go deep with God. And so they go so deep with God, they forget there's anybody else around. And he says, no, I want to stand by the doorway to the kingdom so that I can snag people. As they get close, I can grab them and pull them inside. I want to stand by the door. And, uh, and I think there's something really powerful about that idea, mm -hmm. that imagery of standing by the door. That describes what my parents did all their lives. Uh, yeah. yeah, because I think sometimes as people of maybe faith or people of in ministry, it's it's easy to get caught up in like maybe spiritual activity and things like that, and totally forget the people they are actually you know supposed to you know impact or impart. Yeah, right. So yeah, yeah they're so always thinking ministry becomes a performance rather than ministry. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, how, how did I do, you know, you're always thinking, was that a, was that a, you know, a wonderful sermon on some level, quit worrying about whether it was a wonderful sermon. I mean, we <laughs> want to do our best. We want to be clear as we communicate God's word. We want to be clear and, and we want to be persuasive, but, but it's not about the words. It's more about mm. keeping people uppermost in our, in our hearts. Yeah, and I'm beginning to think that if we are more like people centered, like what you were saying, living our lives to serve, to help others, that's how, like you said, uh, people are naming children after your mom's name because she was, you know, she 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 so positively imparted and you know, blessed them, right? Yeah. Can I tell you one more story about that yeah, part? No, of, please I mean, go I've got ahead. a couple other things that we might talk about, but no, but go certainly. Ahead. Along the lines of this, I mentioned that my mother died when she was 59, mm -hmm. back in 1984. And she was like in good health. Nobody had any idea this was coming. And then all of a sudden, a vein in, or an artery in her brain popped. And, and the doctors say it was probably a weakness that was in that, in that artery, probably from birth. You know, it, there was a weak spot in, in that and, and so on. Anyway, here's the thing. She, uh, she was officially pronounced dead on a saturday now she had the she had the um uh hemorrhage on a wednesday and uh, they immediately took you know took her to the hospital emergency uh to the to the emergency room and began to work with her and she was soon on a respirator because her her uh, breathing and everything was shutting down everything in her brain so by saturday she was 
um, on respirator and, and, and her heart was just pumping strong. Like she was in great health. Her heart was pumping strong, but the doctor said to my dad, I was there. My brother and I still lived in the United States. Actually, we both ended up living in Tennessee. It was kind of an accident that we both lived in the same area, but we uh, lived probably 30 miles apart. We went to the airport, got on the plane together, flew to Kelowna, which is where my parents were uh, living. And um, uh, actually, I'm wrong. I, that's not right. They lived in Kelowna for a number of years, but and she was taken, but they were living in Nelson when... Uh, BC when uh, when she had the hemorrhage and and uh, she was taken by ambulance back to Kelowna because that's where the big hospital was and uh, and so we flew straight to Kelowna arrived on Friday and on Saturday morning uh, we were there when the doctor said to my dad you know we've had no evidence of brain activity any brain waves or anything um, uh, for the last 36 hours or more and as as far you know as he put it I think he said there's nobody there. Her body is still alive. If we continue to have uh, keep her hydrated with intravenous um, and and, uh, and and keep the respirator going, she could live for months this way, you know, a long time. But what do you want us to do? And my father said, I want you to put her in God's hands. And the doctor said, okay. And he went around the room and turned off all the machinery. Last of all, well, last of all, he turned off the uh, respirator. She never drew another breath. And that's okay. That's natural death. She had already died. And anything that extended her life or her physical life beyond that moment was artificial. Anyway, she, uh, uh, he turned off the respirator. Uh, now, the, 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 uh, um, the, the machine that measured her heartbeat was still attached. And we just stood there and watched. And after the, after the respirator was turned off, for the first 15 seconds or so, her heart continued to just beat strongly, perfect little waves, you know, and, and on the screen. And, and then uh, and then she missed a beat, and then she missed a couple more. And by about 40 seconds after they turned the machine off, her last heartbeat was done, and then she was gone. And and when we were singing, I think we were singing Amazing Grace. The family stood around her bed, and we, we sang several hymns, but I think we were singing Amazing Grace when she passed. Now, um, I tell you that to say that the next morning was was church. Now, my dad was no longer the pastor of that church. It was the church he had planted in Kelowna. They already had another pastor because my dad was now planting, my mom and dad were now planting another church in the Nelson area. And uh, um, and so, the, but, and so the, the regular, their new pastor was ready and they had a worship service and so forth. But I noticed that there were a bunch of people there that... Uh, that were they looked new to me as well and and um i've been there before enough to and and uh sure enough the pastor said he said you know he said i've got a message and i can preach it if i need to but he said a lot of you have come today just because joy passed away yesterday and i'd love to give you a chance to maybe just say a few words any of you who wish to to say a few words about um about her influence on your life well, immediately somebody stood up and somebody else stood up and somebody else. And for the next probably close to an hour or something, people and the, the story had all their stories had a very unique pattern that was all almost always the same. They would say things like, you know, well, we're married now, like a husband stand up. This is my wife. But when when Roy and Joy first met us, we were just living together. We were just two hippies living together. And, uh, you know, we didn't think anything about it. Nobody did in those, you know, in that culture. And we were on drugs and we were just, you know, living our lives with whatever seemed uh, pleasurable at the time. But somehow, somehow, and he would, they would always say, we can't even remember now how they found us. But somehow we became friends with Roy and Joy. And, uh, and, and then, uh, Right away, we started getting interested in spiritual things, and we were reading our Bible, and and uh, and we were going to church, and then then we were born again, and you know, and now here we are. We've got three kids, or whatever it was, three, two, whatever. You know, we have three kids, and and uh, and so the next day was scheduled. We we did two things. We uh, my dad wanted to be buried back in the area where he lived near Nelson, and um, and uh, and then. Uh, but we had a funeral service because the church they planted and so many of the people they knew were in Kelowna. So we had a funeral service for my mom on Monday, and the same thing happened. By then, people had come. I think the farthest anybody traveled, there was one family at least from Winnipeg all the way to, to uh, Kelowna. To, 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 uh, 
to be at that funeral service. And the pastor again said, if anybody wants to say anything about Joy's influence on your life, feel free to stand up and do so. And again, just it went on for a long time and and people were telling these stories about, you know, here we are, a solid family living for Jesus now. We didn't know Jesus. We didn't even, the only time we ever mentioned him was in a swear, you know, if we were swearing or something. And and uh, and now, you know, we love him and we live for him. And, uh, and, and I'm just saying that there's something very, very special about that. And uh, later, when my dad was kind of depressed because he was no longer a pastor, I'm talking about 75 80 85 years old and and really because of some physical issues he was having and also a little bit of an early onset of dementia and so forth uh it would have been not it was impossible for him to continue to serve in the way that he had longed to do or that he still longed to do and i would remind him daddy don't you forget every one of those stories about mother was also about you the two of you serving together and 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 your legacy is not that you were a great pastor, but your legacy is that you have touched so many lives, and you're going to see every one of them again. And uh, and I was so glad I could comfort him with the thought that he had served, you know, that he had been of of eternal value to dozens and dozens of lives. And and because it wasn't just the church, the last church. That just happened to be where they were when my mom died. But the same thing would have happened if she had died in Texas or if she had died in Nevada. The same thing wouldn't have happened. And what a what a legacy to take that kind of of um, heritage with you um, to heaven. Wow, wow, that was amazing. That was amazing to share. And thank you for sharing such a personal story. I I I I wanted to ask, uh, like, how how did you how did your family know that she had the hemorrhage? Well, the actual event, I can tell you exactly what happened, <laughs> how it happened. Um, they, uh, my dad was doing, my, my father was always good with his hands. I mentioned he was a foundry worker, he was a welder, but he could do carpentry and he could do a lot of things. He was, a, he, yeah, he was a bricklayer. There were a lot of skills that he had in construction and, and, uh, and, and labor, those kinds of, of things, skilled labor. Um, but, uh, so they were modifying, they were fixing up the house that they had purchased, uh, there outside Nelson, actually in a little community called Slocan, if anybody wants to know exactly where I'm talking about. And that's where most of my parents are now buried in Slocan, British Columbia. But, but, um, um, so he was fixing up the house and, uh, they had lunch on the Wednesday. They had lunch together, just the two of them. And then. Um, they finished up eating and my dad said, well, I'm going to go, I've got some lumber I need to bring in. I'm going to, he was building a new bathroom upstairs, actually adding a bathroom to the upstairs area. And, um, uh, and he said, I'm going to go get some boards and bring them in and carry on with that. And my mother said, well, I'm going to wash, they just had a couple of dishes or, you know, I'll wash these dishes. And then she said, I've got a letter I need to type. This was before computers, 19... Uh, 84, but they didn't have a computer, and most people didn't in 1984. But anyway, um, she had a, a typewriter. She said, I, I've got a letter I need to send to, uh, I don't even know who, uh, now it wasn't one of the family. But anyway, so uh, she washed up a couple things and went into the little room they had designated their office and was typing, and we still have that letter where it suddenly, uh, after probably 150 words or so, they just she stopped in the middle of a word. So my dad came back in with the lumber that he'd gone out to get, and she was standing back in the kit in the kitchen, and, and and she was actually blowing her nose, and she said, "Roy, I don't understand it." She said, uh, "I was just typing, and all of a sudden, I just got a splitting pain in the back of my head, and it traveled over the top of my head, and when it hit my nose, my nose started running," and she was you know trying to lower, and as she said that, she began to tremble and lose control of her of her limbs and my dad grabbed her and set her on on something and he said i've got to take you to the hospital now the best local hospital in nelson and uh he said i gotta take you to the hospital and she said would you wash my feet first because she had been doing some work out in the garden and things and and she said and so he did he quickly washed her feet put her in the car and took her to the hospital and by the time she could talk to him through that evening, but she was losing control of her limbs. She, you know, and, and by the next day, she wasn't even able to communicate any. And uh, by the time Saturday rolled around, it had been 36 hours plus since she had had any sign of brain waves. 
So yeah, it, and she was, as I mentioned, she was 59 when this happened. Uh, strangely enough, a number of years later, I was talking to a, um, uh, I, I was serving a church actually in St. Albert in here in Alberta and um, as the, the pastor and uh, one of the ladies in the church, one of the active ladies, very, very much a Christian woman was a, um, um, she headed up a, the team of surgical nurses. Uh, one of the, you know, a hospital will have a large hospital. Like I think it was, oh boy, I forget, but one of the big hospitals in Edmonton, she headed up one of the teams of the surgical nurses that would help with doctors in surgery. And so she was highly skilled, you know, the surgical nurse type person is far more skilled than maybe the typical biographical nurse that takes care of you in your room. Um, anyway, um, so she, she had just gotten back. We were chatting and I mentioned something about how my mother died and she said, so interesting. She had just gotten back from some kind of medical conference where they talked about this very thing, cerebral hemorrhages. And what she said, what she learned was that nine out of 10 of these cerebral hemorrhages happen to women. It's not exclusive. Some men get them, but mostly, and she said, and, and almost always, it's between the ages of 35 and 60. And my mother was on the high end of that, but, but just barely, just barely under that. So, you know, I, I don't know how much detail you want, but, but <laughs> that just something that she was born with. And it, it happens to other women. Actually, in the years I've served as a pastor, uh, including my mother, I've, I've worked, I've been with two other families, my own family and two others where the wife in that framework of time, the wife passed away suddenly from cerebral hemorrhages. Wow. That's something I had never heard about before. That's why I was interested in what led to it. Like, was there like an impact on the head or was there a fall? Nobody or knows and nobody can say, uh, in, in a, for example, one of them, uh, there was, I mentioned that my mother was in really good health and she was, in fact, she'd had a complete physical just less than two months earlier. So that was kind of unusual, but I mean, unexpected, doubly unexpected, but in the church in St. Albert, uh, and one of the reasons that nurse and I were having this discussion was because a similar one had just happened in, in that church. Uh, and the interesting thing is it was a husband uh, the husband, the husband was a, he is still a uh, medical doctor and and uh, they were in their 40s. He and his wife were in their 40s. And they were the kind of 40-somethings that they're super athletic and, and you know, they, they would ski all winter and ice skate and, and uh, you know, mountain climb all summer, in their spare time, I mean. And, uh, and just very, very active, had two children. Um, and I remember talking with the husband afterward. And, he, and, and of course, as a medical doctor, you would think if anybody could do anything, he was there to do it. Happened in the middle of the night. They were sleeping in the bed, and all of a sudden he woke up and he said, the moment I heard her breathing, I knew what she was, what was happening. And so he said, I shouted at our teenage son who was just in the next room down or something. He said, I shouted at him to call 911 while I began to apply um, uh, artificial respiration or something. I forget what he was doing, but anyway, trying to keep her alive. And, um, and apparently the uh, ambulance was there in less than 10 minutes. They immediately put her on oxygen. They immediately took her to the, to the emergency room there in, in uh, the city of St. Albert and later moved her to uh, Edmonton. But uh, again, you know, in, in terms of modern medical care, nobody could have gotten better care than she. And yet she was gone just that fast. Sometimes people recover from these things, but not always. Most of the time they don't. Wow. Anyway, and this I've told you more, like I am so not a doctor and so not an expert. I'm just sharing with you the, you know, my yeah. own experience and so yeah. forth, but, but do it. That's true. And that, that is to me, I think what I'm learning from this is that sometimes you, sometimes you feel, oh, you know, we shouldn't ever take life for granted because sometimes no. you are like in the best of health, right? Like you go for, they're like, eat right, take your vegetables, you know, like, uh, I don't sure. know. Yeah. So for people that are active or be active, you know, exercise, but yet there's still some things that are unknown, like an X factor, like some things like this. So Every day we are alive is a blessing and is something to be grateful for, for life and for health. Yeah. And we there's shouldn't a think little, There's a short little poem mm -hmm. that says, 
only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I think that that's... And that's the story of joy right there, your mom, because it's only the things, it's only the people she was able to, to impart in the life she had because she didn't know how long or how short it would be. Like she just, you know, did the, the most she could. And right. yeah. So I think this is really a good discussion. Like I feel like people watching or listening should just every day that we're alive is is a blessing, is a gift, and we should u- utilize it to be a blessing to others. Sharing yeah. this gift. Amen. Wow. Well, I didn't know what you were going to share, but I'm so happy that you, this is what you chose to share. Well, when we talked is- yesterday, I didn't know what I was going to share either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But wow, thank you so much. And we would love to have you again. I mean, to chat more with you, to hear more of your stories. But yeah, I, I, I really thank you for, for sharing part of yourself with us. And this story is really precious. And I hope people watching that um, you learned something. Is there one last thing you'd like to say to kind of like, you know, for someone watching? Well, uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, one more thing. Uh, when when we were kids, sometimes we it bothered us. My brother and I in particular, those little brats I mentioned earlier that, you know, would always come with their mothers as their mothers came to visit with my mother. Mm-hmm. They'd get into our bedroom uh, and and uh, the, and we would have like we'd be working on model airplanes or something, and we'd have them on the table in our bedroom, and they weren't completed. But the kids would get in there, and sometimes they would we'd find pieces on the floor and things missing, and it was you know it was irritating. And we used to really get upset that my mother would have all these women over and stuff, and 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 then even there were some times when we would um, speak to one another about resenting. Um, our parents' emphasis on serving others to the point that sometimes we felt like we were left behind. But you know something? Two things stand out about that. Both my brother and I, so I, I, I think in the first time that we visited, because we've done this once before, uh, probably a year ago, it was, probably, it was quite a while back, anyway, many, mo- many months, if not a year. Anyway, um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned then, but my brother passed away uh, a little over two years ago now. Um, he's younger than me, but he, he got, uh, pancreatic cancer and, um, and lived another year after they found it. But he, you know, eventually pancreatic cancer is one of the, one of the worst forms of cancer. If people are diagnosed with it, they almost always die with it. They can, they can fight it, but I forget now, but the number of people that actually live five years after they've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer is very, very small. Anyway. Uh, so, but, but again, my brother had, I think even a greater gift than me in terms of being like my parents in welcoming other people and having an extended relationship with people across the whole United States. He, he never came to Canada. He lived in the United States his whole life. I mean, he visited here, but he never moved here. And, uh, and in the last six months of his life, couples drove from all over the United States or flew to be to just come to his house and spend a couple of hours and just say what a difference you made in my life as he served them for the kingdom and as he brought them to and uh, and and you know I was there um, I was there several months before he passed away I was he lived in Tennessee or in North Carolina I should say just over the line from Tennessee but uh, I was there um, and and uh, spent a week with him the last time we were together and. Uh, it happened just as uh, the COVID flights shutdowns were, I mean, and so I, I grabbed the, literally the last week available and I flew um, before they shut down the, the COVID, before they shut down the airlines for a while. And I flew to see him and spent a week with him and, uh, and got back uh, just the, on the very night where the law changed at midnight and would have prevented me from flying. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, um, so, but the point is, that during that week that I was there, uh, he told me about a couple of people that he was actively engaged with on telephone and sometimes they would even come to his house as he was seeking to help them to understand they need Jesus in their life more than anything else. And, and he was a friend of them and, and doing his best to, you know, and all the, even though he was visibly weaker than he had been and already had, uh, oh goodness, what's the, there's a word for it, uh, 
neuropathy in, in his hands and feet so that to walk was painful and to, even to try to hold a fork or something was, was painful because of the damage to his nerves from the uh, chemotherapy that he was undergoing. And, and, uh, and yet he would talk to, uh, and, you know, to still talk to these folk on the phone and they would come to see him and it's just, you know, very, very uh, much. So what I'm saying is even though if you'd ask me at age 12 or 14, do you love the fact that your parents give their lives away so much? I might have said no. I probably would have said no, and my brother would have as well. But we ended up, by God's grace, being much like them and having, and he especially, I, I really um, uh, I really feel like in, even though he was, again, a, quote, layman, he had a huge impact on people far beyond anything I, I think I can do in many ways. It's a different kind of impact. The reverend just sets you apart and people treat you differently. They treat you funny. But, uh, but, but uh, when you're not a reverend, you can get really close to people. And, and, uh, and he, he did that. And so despite whatever resentment we might have had, God was showing us that's how you live. And that's how we have lived. And he especially lived that way. Wow, 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 wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much for today. Like, I, I, I'm I, so grateful for the stories you've shared, your mom and your brother, and how, I mean, I think the lesson for me, myself, or for anyone watching, is for us to spend our time making that impact. Spend this time we have, like, to be a blessing to others. Yes, because when we leave, that what is going to be our legacy? Like, what will we say we did? Like, we can acquire all the degrees, like a thermometer, like someone says. <laughs> someone jokes, like, he can acquire degrees like a thermometer. We can have, like, you know, money, fame, but the lives that we impart while we are here is, is the most important. Hey. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Schaefer. I'm so, you, so please. grateful. Really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, from here, it's thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll just say bye-bye from here. Bye-bye, everyone. Right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, peace. Bye -bye. God bless you and God bless your work. Thank and, you. And your husband, is your husband a pastor? No, he's not. Okay. <laughs> he he so has really... he has gone through some training. He has gone through the Bible school, but he doesn't practice. Like, I okay. mean, he's not officially, like, serving. Well, okay, but... Again, sometimes the unofficial servants of the Lord yeah. are far more effective because you don't have that. You don't put people on, you know, on guard, so to speak. Yes, and, and, yes. Yeah. It's All always right. a surprise. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> exactly. Yes. No, thank you so much. Okay, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. But your love wins. Give up.